Hello, welcome along to Writer's Routine. This week, our guest is the phenomenally successful, the hugely prolific Anne Cleves. We'll talk about her brand new book, The Long Call, which is the first in a whole new series. Uh, Also, you can hear about how her kind of nomadic life has influenced the way that she tells stories. And we talk about how she has no time for people who can't make time to write. I think that if you want to do it, you'll make time to do it. So there were days when my two kids were very small that it would be stick them in front of Sesame Street for half an hour and I would do half an hour. You know, I wouldn't, there would be no idea of having to work yourself into it if that's the only time you have that was when I would write and I've got friends who are lawyers and doctors and and they still manage to write late at night because it was that important to them I think you you choose how to spend your time and if you want to go to the gym or watch tv rather than write that's fine but You've made that choice. It's a good one this week. Stick around. Loads more on the way with Anne Cleves in this week's Writer's Routine. Yes, hello, welcome along. Uh, My name's Dan. This is Writer's Routine, the show where we take a little look inside the working day of some of the world's most successful writers. And look, uh, let's be honest with it. Let's put it out there. Um, I've got a terrible Christmas cold at the moment. You can probably hear it right now. So I think to save everyone, to save your ears from having to listen to this rancidness, to save my throat from the, like, dagger that is currently lodged right in there, uh, I think we'll crack through my bit as quickly as we can. This week, uh, we're chatting to the uh, amazing Anne Cleves. She managed to publish a book a year for 30 years. I think she still publishes a book a year as well. We talk about her writing year, actually, during the chat. Uh, She's published eight Vera Stanhope books. They were made into a huge telly show in the UK starring Brenda Blethyn. Uh, Eight Shetland books. She finished those off uh, a few years ago with Wildfire. We talk about why she brought that series to an end as well. There are six Stephen Ramsey murder mysteries, three completely independent stories, and she's back with a brand new series set in Devon. It introduces Matthew Venn. And the new book is called The Long Call. So we talk about how she had that idea, the very first moment that the light bulb flicked on inside her head, why she decided to uh, to set it in Devon as well, which is really, really interesting. It's far more commercial than I think uh, a, a lot of readers probably imagine for, for why writers set their stories in the places where they do. We talk about how she managed to keep on writing part-time for over a decade before any real success happened and she finally took off. And she's lived all over the place. She was born in Hertfordshire, raised in North Devon. She's lived in in Shetland. She's lived in the Merseyside as well. And we learn about how her, I guess, nomadic life uh, has affected the way she tells her stories, specifically what she's learned from her life travelling all around the country uh, that has helped her get her ideas down in words so that's all on the way as we dive into it with Anne Cleves and we start as always with what she sees around her in the place where she sits down to write I sit at my kitchen table and although I live in a little suburban 1930s semi in Whitley Bay that's where I live um, somebody said oh you've turned this into a shack and kitchen and I have a bit because it's got a scrub pine table and it's got an auger and it's got um, one of those airers that you can let down on a pulley from the ceiling to put your clothes on to get them to dry and a very big table that I can see 10 or 12 round because all my family come and stay so we knock through we've got a big kitchen and I sit at the kitchen table in my lovely warm kitchen mostly in my pajamas lots and lots of books on the shelves and that's where I make things up. It's quite relaxed. Very relaxed. If I yeah. were to walk into your kitchen, sit down at your massive table, yeah. would I have any clue as to the story that you're writing? Are there post-it notes? Are there bullet points anywhere? No, I don't write at all in advance. So I, that feels like a bit of a trap to make notes and to certainly don't do any plot synopses or anything like that. It has to be in my head. So it's like you're writing from memory rather than imagination. Is there any other form of inspiration around you? I've spoken to crime writers before who perhaps will have a picture 
uh, of, or a map of somewhere where they are writing so they know the precise streets that the villain is going to run away through. Have you got anything like that for you? No, because I don't really... I do have an Ordnance Survey map when I'm writing about North Devon because I don't know it that well. I mean, it, I grew up there, but and that's where the latest series is, so I've got an Ordnance Survey map of that just to work out where the places are in relation to each other. But no, because again, it has to be in my head. If I can't see it clearly in my head to write about it, then I can't expect the reader to see it either. So, Have you got any other... I mean, there are none so far, apart from how casual and relaxed you are. Are there any little quirks of your writing that you need to help the day go smoothly? Tea. I need lots of tea. <laughs> I get up and make tea, and I might break for breakfast, but I might be typing away while I'm eating my breakfast at the same time. So, yeah, it's it's about it's just about the story and storytelling and about fixing what I'm seeing in my head on the page. So I don't want distractions. I don't play music. I don't... Um, don't like any sort of noise or so I'm just there in my kitchen once I'm a bit further on in the book I can write pretty well anywhere trains and airport lounges and things but not when I'm starting off very simply can you bring to mind perhaps the strangest place that you've got words down Uh, I don't think I've been anywhere particularly strange I mean odd hotel rooms and yeah I can't write actually in aeroplanes because it's all a bit tight. And But trains, I lots and lots of writing on trains. And trains are brilliant for if you're a bit stuck with a plot because there's nothing else you can do and your mind sort of freewheels while you're looking at the, at the countryside as you go past. And that's quite often where an idea will come quite quickly and I'll know, yeah, that's what it's going to be. That's how it's going to work. Very tediously... What are you writing on? Is it just a simple laptop with Word? It is a laptop with Word, yeah. For When I first started, it was all longhand, pre-digital stuff. And then I would, for the first book, I first two or three books, I typed myself from longhand notes. And it must have been just awful to read because I'm not a skilled typist. So lots of tipex and just mistakes. But then I decided that was just a waste of time so I got somebody to type it for me and when I started I had two very small children so it would be that's why I started writing early in the morning get up really early before they did crack on then we're we're getting a flavor for the day now which is fantastic it's kind of the point of the show we're called writer's routine I think what we'll do quite often I do this with prolific authors such as yourself I, I like to see how your how the way you write through your day has changed throughout time so we'll have a look at how you wrote your first book in just a sec but just talk to me about the most recent one which is yeah. the long call the long call uh, describe to me a day in the life of Anne Cleves writing the long call the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed how does it look just so much depends because the the more successful commercially you are the more the less time you actually have to write so you know I could be in a, a normal writing day, I could be on a train to London for a meeting with a publisher, or I could be um, going to do some charity event that I've agreed to, or going to, um, quite recently, I ran some writing workshops for bus drivers in Bristol um, for, a, for Unite, the, the union. So that's why I get up early so I quite often have to write before other people's working day starts. So usually I'm awake for the shipping forecast at about 5.20 and up and ready to start writing 6 o'clock-ish, still in my pyjamas, in my kitchen, lots of tea, and we'll do that. And if if I'm lucky enough to have a completely free day, that might go on certainly until lunchtime and then a little bit in the afternoon but I can usually only concentrate for more than a, not more than about 1500 words because again it's that thing of fixing it in your head and concentration is almost more important than than being creative that you need to be able to concentrate on what you're writing on and after about 1500 words the concentration lapses a bit how many hours does 1500 words tend to take you depends how it's going if it's at the beginning and I'm really fired up and I've got an idea for how I want a scene to go then I could do it in a couple of hours if it's 
if it's the middle and I'm not sure how I'm going to work all these ends out, how it's all going to come together, it might take pretty well all day. It's just, it's all quite relative. Walking's good, just a bit of exercise, get out, fresh air, go for a walk along the beach and just try and, and just let it ferment away in your head and eventually something will come, I think. But because I've written so much, I know that it usually does come, so I don't panic anymore. You know, there's not that, oh, it's never going to work out. I don't know how it's going to end, what's going to happen. My life's at an end. I don't really get like that anymore. I get, I'm quite calm about it. Just take a break, take a walk. I hope for a long train ride coming up that I can unblock. I just mentioned over 30 books. How, how is your first draft now? Is it, is it, is it almost the thing that I see uh, when, no, when I buy a novel? No, all, because the first draft is me writing it because I don't, because I don't plot in advance and I don't know where I'm going really. The first draft comes and goes, so I'll, I'll write a bit and then I'll maybe go back a bit and correct and change, tack, and then write a bit more. So the beginning actually probably gets more rewrites than the end, because by the time I'm near the end I know where I'm going properly and it finishes properly. So my first draft then will go to my two agents, Moses and Sarah, Moses in the US and Sarah here. And they will look at it and read it very closely and very carefully and come back with sometimes quite brutal notes. Because with a, with a first draft, you're so close to it. And that, that picture that I've captured, I can see perfectly well. Sometimes you forget that the reader can't see that and just need a pointer. And there are bits that you think you might have got away with where the writing's a bit clunky or a bit long-winded. You do need somebody to say, that needs to be a lot tighter and I couldn't quite believe in this person and what are you doing here? And so I get, yeah, lots of quite brutal notes back from my two agents and then there will be a complete second redraft then and then it'll go to my editors and then they'll get back either with structural changes or more likely because it's already been looked at by two fresh pairs of eyes. Just quite, just sort of uh, nuanced changes and that's important too. Rather than the, the plot just doesn't hold together, we don't believe that this person <laughs> would have done that. So we're kind of talking about the year now, this always fascinates me. There was a point where you were writing one a year. Is that still the case? Yes. So can you talk me through uh, a writing routine of a year then? So January through January 1st through December 31st, at what point are you getting a new idea? At what point are you get putting down, getting down your first draft? Okay. When's it got to be handed in for? Or when are you getting new ideas? All of that, Anne. Yeah, well, um, I think delivery date is usually December, but I'm usually ahead of that just because so January is where I'm thinking about new ideas and I might already have started writing a bit of the book and I've certainly been to the place where it's set got a sense of not the characters so much as a tone or a voice or something that I want to explore a theme perhaps or an, even a single image or metaphor that might bring some cohesion throughout the book and I'll start writing in the new year. Uh, I usually try and deliver, because at the moment publication is September usually, so I try and deliver before, or at least get close to a first draft myself before I start touring with a new book. February is busy usually because that's paperback publication time, so January is a real get the bolts and the nuts and the the first few chapters so at least I've got a sense of this place and this book and how it's going to feel and how it's going to read then February is usually traveling with the paperback I mean not the whole month but bits of it and then you have to slot in literature festivals and things that might come in throughout the year but that's how it works how much pressure do you then feel under as uh, a, a complete pantser? You don't. You mentioned that you don't plot at all. When you know that you've got to get your first draft done before you start touring in September, how much pressure do you then feel under to 
I need to get this done now. You're not a writer that sits there and thinks, right, January the 1st, I'm going to write 1,500 words. This is what's going to happen. No, not at all. How do you make that work in your mind where you don't know what's going on? Uh, Well, that's the fun, isn't it? Because if I knew how it would finish, there would be no fun in writing it. So partly it's needing to know what's going to happen next that drives me on. I do write like a reader, so I want to know what's going to happen next, so I have to write it. So that's a that's an impetus to carry on writing and get it done. Rather philosophically, how much of your story do you think is already in your mind before you figured it out? Uh, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that before. I don't think so because I think this is my creation. You know, I'm the god in my universe. I'm writing this book, and it's so. I don't think it's there lurking somewhere underneath I have to work at it and bring it out and and it has to be quite balanced and satisfying I think I, I want it to be balanced and satisfying it's interesting when, because you mention you write as if you are the reader and the fact it's not already there is is quite a curious balance to make we've spoken about the writing routine of your day now take me back so the first book was published 1986 it was and it's that took a long time to write that book I think first novels always do because you're never quite sure that you're going to get to the end and how it's going to work I started writing it when we were living on a tiny tidal island called Hilbury which is between the Wirral and North Wales Uh, it's only 11 acres when the tide comes in it's an island and nobody can get on or off when the tide goes out you can walk across the mud and the rocks about a mile and a half to the mainland my husband was the warden of the nature reserve there there's not a lot to do if you're not into birds and natural history and I'm not terribly so (laughs) that's when I started writing it and I was also pregnant so that was when I started writing it and then the baby came and we moved off to the mainland and I went back to work as a probation officer for a bit. And so I was writing little tiny bits as I was going, but had no real sense. And then I think there was, I think Susan Hill was doing the book programme on Radio 4 and there was a competition for a first novel. And I thought, oh, and that was the, gave me the push to get it finished. We didn't get anywhere in the competition, but at least I'd, you know, I'd, at least I got to the end and then was able to revise it and send it off to a publisher but then it was it really was just bits and pieces and by this time I had a three-year-old and a newborn so it was um, I can remember thinking yeah, that's right because my, my oldest when she was three I got her into playgroup we'd moved by this time down to Worcestershire when my husband went for the RSPB and her first day at playgroup and I made sure that the baby was asleep you know just by timing by poking her to keep her awake until it was time to take the (laughs) three-year-old off to playgroup that I would have that couple of hours hour and a half when Sarah was at playgroup to write and did that and the other mum said oh you've got some time to yourself what are you going to be doing thinking maybe go shopping or no (laughs) I'll be, or cleaning the house. Some of them said, oh, great, you've got some time to do some housework. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was never at the top of my list. Don't you think we all have it in us? Because I think it's like when you see kids playing in the playground and even now, you know, they're chasing around and you be, you be the cop, I'll be, I'll be, I know, probably different now, ninjas or Pokemon things or something. But they're pretending to be somebody else and they're exploring their world by imagining being somebody different. And I think that's what we do as storytellers. Well, I guess the question then is, why have you still got that need, whereas so many other adults have lost the desire to tell a story? I think I've always had it. I can remember before I could read and write, looking at what I was doing and describing it in the third person. It stopped that, and I had this continual running narrative in my head of me describing what was going on in my life in the third person. And that stopped when I started reading and writing. But... I can remember being really, really young. In 2006, was it you won the... Um, the Gold Dagger, yeah. So that's 20 years after... Starting writing. Yeah, so yeah. you have to enjoy it, because I wasn't making any money out of it. That's amazing. To, to, to push on for, for 20 years, writing still part-time. Yeah. What changed, do you think, about 
your style of writing? How did it develop the way you told stories in those 20 years? Well, it was a new name for the gold dagger that's been that been going for ages and ages. It was just that it was sponsored by somebody different. So they called it the Duncan Lorry Award, which is great for me because Duncan Lorry was a bank and there was a prize money, <laughs> which the gold dagger never had before. But So what was it about how your writing had changed within 20 years that meant I think this book was, had won the award? I think it's more about the subject matter. 2006 was a time when Scandi Noir was, you know, Helen Mankell was big, I think you and Nesbo had just started. Um, and so I wrote a book set in Shetland, Raven Black set in Shetland, and that was as close to Scandi as you're going to get in the UK. And so I think in a way it was the setting that captured reviewers imagination I mean I'm sure the writing got stronger because after 20 years of practicing at something you would hope that it had got a lot stronger what is it get stronger about writing Uh, I think you're more confident so you're more able to take risks maybe Um, you just have a better idea of what works on the page Sometimes it's about knowing where to leave gaps for the readers to bring in their own story and their own perspective. It's not telling too much, just little details that will bring a character or a scene to life. Not you, know, you don't need pages and pages of description. You're quite a nomadic person. You've been nomadic throughout your life and moved all over the place. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, been up in the northeast since the mid-80s and love it there. That's home still. But lived in... Shetland and lived in North Devon and lived in Worcestershire and lived on Merseyside yeah and lived in London how 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 much do you think that has affected the way you tell stories the the, the fact you've seen more of life and of the world than perhaps someone else I think that's important because I think people grow out of the places where they live so I don't know some scouser that I was taking to court as a probation officer for breaching his licence is going to be different because he grew up on one of the big council estates in Birkenhead and I've been into that flat and I know his parents and all that is going to feed into the imagination when I'm building character. And then, you know, the yummy mummies in the village in Worcestershire where we lived who were very into clean houses I can write about them as well because I've met them and have seen them it's in a way it's it makes you lazier as a writer because you don't have to research so much and you don't have to make so much up because you have that sense of who these people are because you've met them how much did meeting you know criminals and and murderers at times how, how much does that impact then the way that you write those Uh, The murderers, I only met, I think, two or three murderers, and they were, without exception, boring, inadequate little men, always men, um, who just drunk too much, lost their temper, couldn't control themselves. They wouldn't feature in any of my novels. But some of the people that I did meet, you know, who I met through, because in those days probation wasn't only about um, working for the criminal courts, we worked for the divorce court and also through adoption services. So I could be a guardian ad litem looking after the interests of a child about to be adopted one day, going and talking to the natural mother, making sure that that's what she wanted, that she hadn't been pressured into giving the baby up. And then another day, yeah, uh, writing a report for... uh, a pre-sentence report for the court. I'm going to visit some heroin user on a council estate in Birkenhead. How much at the time do you think you were consciously storing these memories away because you might use them? And how much of it is just generally through osmosis? Yeah, not consciously at all, I don't think, because I wasn't, although I'd started to write at that point, it was very much um, quite like golden age fiction at that point. So the first book have a elderly amateur sleuth a naturalist who falls over bodies on nature reserves because that's what I knew you know that's mm. and it it was also quite fun um, and it's also I think those early books quite a lot about obsession and that because bird watchers can be very obsessive and so that that was quite an interesting exploration of something that was a bit more serious but it wasn't about lads growing up in poverty in 
bits of the northeast or bits of Merseyside. My last question that's more abstract, and we'll get down to the book in just a sec. You've mentioned that you have no time for people who don't have the time to write. Yeah. Why is that? Can you just expand on that for me? I think that if you want to do it, you'll make time to do it. So there were days when my two kids were very small that it would be stick them in front of Sesame Street for half an hour and I would do half an hour. You know, I wouldn't. There would be no idea of having to work yourself into it if that's the only time you have was when I would write and I've got friends who are lawyers and doctors and and they still manage to write late at night because it was that important to them I think you you choose how to spend your time and if you want to go to the gym or watch tv rather than write that's fine but you've made that choice before we get back into it with Anne, a very quick plug for the Patreon. Listen, I've been, it's over Christmas, loads to do. I've been a little bit uh, remiss, I think, with some of my Patreon admin. So if you are waiting uh, for some merch from the show because you've pledged, uh, thank you so much for it. Uh, it is on its way now. I think I've covered everyone that needs something. If you are still waiting, uh, give it a couple of days and then furiously email me and I'll get stuff off to you as quick as I can over the weekend. Uh, if you would like some stuff... If you want to get involved, if you want to help out the show, just pledge what you can over at Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash writers routine. The best way that you can help us out to say thanks for bringing you 80 different authors, all giving individual nuggets of advice, varied chats about wide lives and different stories. Uh, if you want to help us, just pledge what you can. A dollar or so a month really goes a long way, I promise. It's patreon.com forward slash writers routine. Right, let's crack on with Anne Cleves. See what I say? We are motoring on with this today because she was so fantastic with her time, Anne. She gave me a load of chance to ask as many questions about all the different points of writing that we're interested in. So I want to make the most and, and play you as much of the chat as I can. And also, the Christmas cold is quite bad for all of us, I think we can agree. Now, in this part of our chat with Anne Cleves, uh, we talk about if TV adaptations of her stories has changed the way that she writes books and characters uh, afterwards. Also, we talk about those characters and why she makes the decisions that she does for them and where she thinks those decisions come from. And we pick things back up, talking about her brand new story, The Long Call. It's the first one of a brand new series set in Devon. Uh, and we get into it, talking about when she had that very first idea for what became The Long Call. Yeah, I was down visiting an old school friend in North Devon because that's where I grew up. Well, I was there from 11 till I left home. And um, just thinking about a new setting for a book and thinking that actually North Devon, somebody had said to me, my, my US agent said, well, what about Devon? And I knew that he was thinking of cream teas, thatch cottages, very cosy, and that wasn't the sort of book that I wanted to write, but went down and just explored around the area and realised that actually North Devon is, going back to the geography again, very, very mixed. So Ilfra Coombe has drug problems. It's an old seaside town, so the big guest houses are now turned into homes of multiple occupation. There might be bailed hostels. There'll be hostels for homeless people. So you've got that sort of community there but you've also got the rich folk who come for the surfing and you've got the locals and some rural poverty and it was that sense that I could write about this and not make it cosy in the same way that I think triggered the book to start with. Then you need to have an actual plot, an actual idea. If you don't know anything else that's going to come, what do you know when you start writing day one? I know who I knew who the detective was because I'd thought that through. So Matthew Venn comes from a was the doted on only child of parents who belonged to quite a, a strict, rigid evangelical community, Christian community. And he'd been brought up with this notion of the rapture and that the chosen would be taken up into the sky for a thousand years when the end of the world came. You know, the the sort of thing that um and, and there are quite small religious communities that grew out of the West Country, like the Plymouth Brethren. You know, that's obviously where Plymouth comes from. So, and then thinking, what would happen if you lost your faith? And then what would happen if you happened to be gay? 
you know, would reconciliation with the family be possible at that point? And that's really where Matthew starts. And at this moment, do you have any idea of the, the case that he's going to no, investigate? No, it's all character-led. So I have him, the first scene is with him um, standing outside the crematorium, knowing that his father funeral is going on inside there's a service going on inside the chapel there hearing voices that he recognizes but not feeling that he would be welcome so not going in and then there's a shout and he's called to a body and and that's so we, we don't know whether he would have been brave enough to go in or whether there would have been that possibility because the phone goes and he's off you'll have to forgive my naivety and just lack of comprehension on this so when you're starting to write, you've got this character and then he gets a shout that there's a body over there. Yeah. At what point do you know there's a body over there? When I write it. I just, it's amazing because you're a cry, and I'm, I know you've probably had this a lot, so I'm sorry if I'm treading over old ground, um, hopefully for a new audience. Uh, I just can't get my head around a crime writer, such a prolific crime writer and successful as yourself, not having any idea what the crime of the next story is going to be. No, not at all. So he comes, and I know where it's going to be. I know where the body's going to be. And he drives to this place called Crow Point, which is where a bit of land, a spit of land, goes into the estuary, just where the river Tor, the rivers, because there are two rivers, the Tor and the Torridge go into the Irish Sea. And it's, it's kind of insubstantial and being eaten away by the water and the wind. And I knew that that was where the body was going to be, but I didn't know who the victim was when I wrote that scene. And then I had to find out, so I had to write the next scene. Crime writers are known for using the tricks of the, of, of the trade, keeping someone reading, using all these red herrings, that kind of stuff. If you are not knowing what's happening, how are you using all the techniques of crime writing to keep me reading? Well, sometimes I'll have to go back and rewrite. As I said, that's why the beginning is rewritten much more than the end, because by the time I've got to the end, I know more or less where I'm going. So I'll go back and rewrite. Um, and I just read a lot. And I think it's a bit like, I would say it's like a stand-up comedian who knows where the tagline's going to be. You know, you, you, pace, you pace a joke as you're telling it, and you know, and you draw the listener in, and you take them on a journey and then you know when you're going to hit them with a tagline. I wanted to write about a happy marriage because I'd never written about a happy marriage before and I wanted their, them to have a happy marriage and so I knew that he had a husband. Why was he gay though? Where did that come from? Partly I think because um, I explained my husband died about two yeah. years ago and the people that scooped me up and looked after me when I got back from the hospital uh, yeah, obviously along with my daughters as well but they were the people who took me in fed me that night took care of the funeral details and they were, they were close friends of my husband and mine and they were a gay couple and I think because they were in my head when I was writing it because I'd started writing, I was just about to start writing the book at that point that that's that's they were just there and I wanted to write about kindness I think and they're just such a kind couple it, and it also then when I it, it also did explain a bit of the plot that if if Matthew had just lost his faith even in that dramatic way the family might have been or his mum might have been a bit more willing to to talk to him have him back Bill Bridges, the fact that he was gay really made that very tricky for her. But there's no brainstorming. You're not sitting down there mind mapping this character. He's no. just... I, I really enjoyed your... You looked so bewildered then as if, why would anyone do that? Yeah, I can't... I can't understand how anybody... I, you see, once I'd done that, once I'd known it and this is how it's going to be and that's going to happen and it's going to end up here, I would just think, well, there's no point writing it then. What is the fun in writing it if you know how it's going to end? I just wouldn't, I wouldn't have that, I, it, I wouldn't want to get up at half past five every morning to, to do something that I already knew. There would be no adventure, there'd be no, none of that scariness about, am I going to make it work this time? Is it all right? Is it going to work? Speaking about the ending, at what point do you know the ending? 
Oh, with the long call, it was about a chapter from the end. It was, it was inching towards it. And then suddenly something happened and I realised, oh yeah, that's what it's about. That is what this book is about all along. It, it's just, uh, and then... I'd, l- I'd love to sit there for your edit, just, just to see how you then piece this all together. Uh, let me just quickly talk to you about uh, Wildfire. Yes. So you've got the Shetland books, eight of them. Why was that drawn to an end? Um, well, because it was always only... Well, first of all, it was going to be four. And then I thought, well, no, I think it would stretch to another four books. Things were happening in Shetland that I wanted to explore. Um, and so there were another... F- but I knew that there would not be any more after that. That was it. Because... It's a nice round number, two quartets, and I wanted to stop before I got bored writing them and before the readers got, even more importantly, got bored reading them. So when you're sitting down to write the eighth one, yeah, you're not going to like this. <laughs> so how much do you then know about that one because you know that this needs to tie in not just one book but the, the a whole series? Yeah, I had to decide whether I was going to kill Jimmy Perez off or not and there was a moment when I thought, shall I just kill him and then... There won't be any temptation to come back, but that seemed a bit brutal. And I ended the first quartet. The fourth book ends up with somebody who the readers got very fond of dying. So I thought, no, that, that would just be too much to do it again. That just wouldn't work. So, yeah, I knew, I knew that there would be some form of reconciliation, that there would be a new beginning for him, but I wasn't entirely sure what that would be. So I had had a sense of the feeling that I wanted readers to have when I was coming towards the end. I had that, but I didn't have any detail. How much do you think about the voice when you are writing? What voice I am reading it in, in, in my head, the, 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 the narrative voice that is coming yeah, through? I choose three or four different points of view to write from. The, the main returning characters, so in Wildfire, Jimmy Perez and and Sandy Wilson, and then a couple of suspects usually, or or a couple of witnesses to the crime, sometimes more than that, and that's important because I like seeing the world through these different people's eyes, and they use different, they each have a different voice and a different tone when they're, even though it's all in the third person. It's, it's a bit different. I sometimes hear Brenda Blethyn, who plays Vera, her voice in my head when I'm writing dialogue now. But I don't write a scene thinking, oh, I can't do that because they won't be able to adapt it for telly, or, oh, this will work on television. That I write the book, somebody else does the screenplay, directors, and I don't care if they change the murderer or if they... Because that's their job their job is to write good television my job is to write the best novel that I can write when uh, a fan of your work picks up the next book what do you want them to take away from it so when someone picks up the next Anne Cleves book what do you hope they think it will be I think there's there is a tone through it that is again it's going back to kindness I think there's a thread running through of compassion and understanding and kindness. Um, I was at a, a dinner of people who love Georges Simenon's Maigret books last night, and Maigret says, my role is not to judge, it's to understand. And if you can help, if you can explain how people might do dreadful things but not be dreadful people, that's quite interesting. I'm quite interested in that kind of... Um, psychological archaeology where we dig back into people's past to find out what's turned them into who they are so that is you know the sort of why done it rather than who done it thing is is what is interesting to me setting your stories in shetland and i know that you you don't you give drafts to shetlanders isn't that yeah, the case absolutely yes how clearly a lot is the answer to this question but how much are you then thinking about your place being authentic. I could go to North Devon. I, sorry, I could read y- your work and I'd feel like I am there in North Devon. I hope so, yeah. That's important. And that's not about detail. You know, I sometimes make up villages and I have, I'm not, I know Ian Rankin will drive from one place to another to make sure that he's got the timing right. And for, for a Rebus book, I don't do any of that. 
Um, I'm quite, but what is important is that sense of the place. Again, it's atmosphere and tone and voice, and so that you would feel that you knew it, even though the details might not be right. How are you conveying all that in words? I know that's such a ridiculous question to ask a writer. As in, how 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 is writing about North Devon different from writing about Shetland? Because it's a different place, so everything's going to be different, isn't it? You you create characters that would grow out of that place and partly that's you know just a function like in Shetland if you're sitting in a in a cafe in Lerwick the talk will be about sheep fiddle music fish the extortionate price that the ferries charge to get south and if I'm sitting somewhere in North Devon it will be about those bloody grockles that are blocking the roads or it might be about private schools if you're in a certain suburb because it might be a bit of an affluent bit or it might be about nobody still redeveloping that site on the south bank of the tour mm-hmm. where the where I which I turned into the woodyard so all that it's I mean it's just obvious it's about where we live and where we grow up affects how long we live because it's about poverty and class and about it's about how, the words that we use so in Shetland somebody might talk about a young girl as a lass in North Devon it would be a maid you'd be all right my maid in a way that you wouldn't so it's just of course place place is conveyed in everything that you're writing you mentioned Rebus and Ian Rankin um, what is it about Scotland for, for crime, by the way, because I mean, I've, I've spoken to many, many crime authors, mostly Scottish. So Ian Rankin, Val McDermid, Stuart McBride, and, yeah, and there's you up in Shet. Yeah. And now there's you. And I think Val McDermid sa- said to me, I was asking her about why she changes characters, why she makes a new series for her. And she said, Well, it's kind of all I can do. I mean, I can't go up into the Shetland now because <laughs> Lodi Ann Cleves has got it. So, um, yeah. what is it about Scotland and crime that is so alluring for writers? Oh, it's dark nights, isn't it? And big spaces. Well, for me, I could tell you why Shetland for me. I mean, be, be far beside the fact that I know it very well and I first went there 40 years ago and, um, and it's very special. For me, it's those, there are no trees really in Shetland. So, it's huge open landscapes and the contrast when you're writing between that and hidden secrets that's what's brilliant about writing Shetland and that is it for this week's writer's routine thank you so much to Anne Cleves for coming on the show Uh, so generous with her time and with her words of advice as well I really enjoyed how how much of a pantser she is and how utterly baffled she was that anyone would sit there and plot their stories. And it really serves to remind us that there's no way to skin the cat of telling a story, is there? There's no one way to write. So many people do it in so many different ways. Um, and I'm, I constantly am learning more ways, and it's fantastic to be reminded of them every time I get the chance to sit down with an author. If you'd like to hear more authors on the show, if you'd like to get these more regularly, the easiest way to help us out is to uh, pledge what you can over at patreon.com forward slash writer's routine. Just a dollar a month really goes a long way. You can get some badges, you can get bookmarks, some writer's routine merch over there, and it just helps out the show. Uh, so go and do that if you can, if you're feeling a little bit Christmassy and you want to help us out. Also, if you live in the States, we've got a fantastic audiobook offer that you can take advantage of with Libro.fm. It helps you support small independent and bookstores and not um, the big global taking over the world uh, book behemoths uh, so uh, look in the description the podcast notes for this episode is everything you need to know about that libro.fm audiobook offer now we should be here next week with another episode and i think that will probably be the last one of 2020 listen to the state of my voice though uh, if for some reason i'm not with you next week that'll be why probably because i can't talk if there are any words left, though, if I can muster out any speech, uh, I'll endeavour to give you another, another episode uh, next week, which will be the last one before Christmas, and then we'll see each other again in 2020. Uh, so until then, uh, make sure you give us a follow on Twitter and on Instagram. You can rate and review the show as well on Apple Podcasts. That really helps things out. Uh, and thanks for listening. I will see you next time on Writer's Routine. Bye. Bye.